Okay, welcome back to the show here. We did a little tactical uh, shuffling of the cards. and Hopefully they can hear us in the uh, room, the uh, hundreds of people that have made it here tonight as part of the no Modern Knowledge Tour 2014. And now we've got uh, Linda Moulton Howe and Richard Dolan joining us. Hello. And maybe I heard, guys, that maybe this is the first time you guys have been on an together. interview together. Have we? I don't think we ever have been on an interview together. I don't, I don't know. Because I mean, you guys know each other really oh, yeah, very well known for many years. Oh, yeah, we've each other for a long time. But no, I don't, I don't I think don't we've think done a lot we of things together. All right. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is, you is one of my see, favorite see, people in the entire world. And it's so funny because in Canada, I, you are both from the States, and in Canada, we have to go to the States for these kinds of things to happen. And you came to Canada to be together. This is the first time yeah. you guys are, that's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> well, I think when we're at conferences, which is normally where our lives would cross, he does his speech, I do mine. If there are workshops, everything is always going on like a constant it's moving Rubik thing. Yeah. And so it's, we have to fight to get time to sit down and actually talk at conferences. They're hectic. Well, that, I mean, I guess this is a really good sign, though, because that means what you guys are doing, which is so out there by some people's standards, but it's really, really growing. You, if you are so busy with what you're doing. This must be, I mean, and you guys have been doing this for so long. This must be just so gratifying for you to see how, how much it's growing. I don't think it's out there because I've always been a mainstream journalist. I'm a producer, writer, director, editor and investigative reporter and my beat has always been science medicine and the environment that's what i i graduated from stanford university i uh, produced films for them in the stanford medical center uh, wow. my master's thesis was on the stanford linear accelerators first efforts to get computers to analyze the uh, atomic bombardment particles and so it was this background of always being in the hard-nosed science that when I was director of special projects at the CBS station in Denver and I started work there in 1978, they, everything I was doing was science, medicine, and the environment. And one of the stories in Colorado and here in Canada in almost every province back then wow were the bloodless, trackless animal mutilations. And I had one of the most interesting conversations with your investigator for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Calgary. And he had seen the documentary I did, A Strange Harvest, and I had never talked to him. He called me at the station, and he had gotten a copy of the program, which is about mutilated animals and some law enforcement saying the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. This is not the reporter saying this. Mm -hmm. This is law enforcement. And when Lynn Lauber, who was head of the mutilation investigation in Calgary for the Royal Canadian Mounted Police called me, and he said, I've seen your film, and I just want you to know it's everything that we're investigating. And I said, sir, then why? Are you putting out headlines throughout Canada that's picked up in the United States that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are focusing on a cult, a satanic cult named O, the letter O. A book had been written about this back in the 70s. Mm. Literally, this was his answer to me. Because we have to get the public and the media off our back. And I said then, you've seen my documentary, and you know that law enforcement is telling me that the perpetrators are creatures from outer space. And he said to me on the phone, this is not on camera, I would agree. That is the background to the animal mutilations. That is the background to why, if you are a producer, writer, director, editor, and your beat is science, environment, and medicine, and you get yourself buried into all the work it takes 18 hours a day to try to get to the bottom of animal <coughs> mutilations, and this is what you're being told by law enforcement. And then you realize that from the Royal Canadian Mounted Police in Canada to sheriff's offices, police offices, attorney general's offices in the United States, everybody is not telling the truth because somehow the fix is in. 
It will not be politically correct for your career if you investigate the animal mutilations that are linked to extraterrestrials. And so I'm here today because 35 years hmm. I have simply been trying to build the solid, hard brick evidence that supports what those sheriffs told me back in 79 and what Lynn Lauber in Calgary told me on the phone. The perpetrators of animal mutilations are creatures from outer space. And how can you go through that and not want to know who, what, why? What does the Canadian government, the American government, the Chinese government, all the governments, what do they know? And why is there a policy of denial to the taxpayers around the world mm -hmm. on something as fundamental as we're not alone in the universe? And my colleague, uh, Rich Dolan, has gone into the history about what is the foundation for such a policy of denial that would persist from World War II to this day, and you and I know how many layers of lies. Yeah. Exactly. I love what you said. I want to answer your question, okay. which is, I can't even remember now, but you talked about, it, is like, why are people, are there more people interested in this now? It's growing, I, think I would have thought. How, it's, how did we get into this? Well, and we growing got into momentum. It in a very compatible way. We both came in through what we f was a mainstream prism. But I will say, I've only been involved in this now researching 20 years, 20, maybe 21 years. And I have noticed a definite cultural sea change from my part, and that's why I think we're so busy. It's insane in terms of the amount of activity right. that both of us are engaged in that's because right. there, is, there is a profound hunger for knowledge that people have. And they know that in their everyday life they're being lied to about the whole structure of what their reality is supposed to be. They know this. Even if they, they don't know it in their heads, they know it in their bones, that there's something very de desperately wrong about the construct of their reality. And uh, so they're searching for altern literally alternative news. And uh, that, whole, that whole field has grown exponentially in the last 20 years. I mean, more than 20 years ago, there was, there was no internet. There was no true m wide outlet for this type of research. The MUFON Journal would have maybe 2,000 copies, you know, very limited stuff. But now it's, it's the potentials for millions and millions of people to ex uh, be involved and to get this information. And guess what? They're into it. And that includes conferences, that includes events like uh, this modern knowledge tour that we're doing going across Canada in an RV, meeting people <laughs> across this country and discovering that there is a tremendous desire, I hear them clapping in there, yes. uh, for this kind of information. So there's, there's um, as Linda was saying, there's um, this huge disconnect between this massive reality that's obviously here, that's obviously important, that is being, and, and the fact that it's being denied by all of the official powers that be. And but the one people know there's a problem with one it. One of the things that goes right to the heart of what's happening now is more and more whistleblowers. Yeah. I don't think in the last, <coughs> well, if, if I got into this 35 years ago, it's just been in about since around 2007. There has been an uptick, and it seems to keep growing, and I have more. We're talking about substantive people who have worked on the back engineering of extraterrestrial technology and are prepared to say that. And the Corso, Lieutenant mm -hmm. Philip J. Yeah. Corso, mm -hmm. uh, a man who NBC embarrassed, and they had no right to, his background was incredible. He worked with General Arthur Trudeau in the Pentagon. Yeah. The, the story of Lieutenant Philip J. Corso was the truth about the United States government in collaboration, I'm sure, with the World War II, we'll call them allies of Canada, England, the uh, <coughs> New Zealand, and Australia. But in the United States, it was Philip J. Corso's own firsthand testimony that he was being handed in the Pentagon extraterrestrial technology defined as such 
and taking it to, let's say, one person, let's pick Corning Glass, mm -hmm. could have been a, a, any corporation that they needed to analyze. He has a one-on-one -on -one connection through the Pentagon. It is handed over. No one in Corning Glass knows that it's extraterrestrial. And Philip J. Corso, in detail, dis defines and describes he was the guy taking this material to these different corporations under the highest levels of government. General Trudeau was appointed by General uh, Eisenhower, who became president, and they knew each other from the war. And uh, President Eisenhower says to Trudeau, I want you to be our first research, uh, science and research director in the Pentagon because as I understand it, Rich, he was the only Army general ever to this day who had a PhD. Arthur Trudeau? General Arthur Trudeau mm -hmm. was a PhD in engineering. And Eisenhower oh, bonded with him when they were in World War II, trusted him, and that's why he handpicked. Mm -hmm. Trudeau knew Corso yeah. from the Italian campaign, and men in war or men and women, the they go to trust. the people they trust. Of course. Of course, of course. That book, that man, deserves to be on everybody's reading list around the world, and yet, when this man, he was dead only eight months after the book came out, when he was interviewed in an NBC program, the we'll call them the so-called host investigator. They used a part in where uh, Lieutenant Colonel Corso said that they knew they were dealing with time. And I think he said something about timelines, which implied time travel. Right, right. And yeah. when NBC ran that program, the this way was during the 50th anniversary of Roswell, it was I believe. The, the program came later after that, but it was in that same milieu with mm -hmm. a built book. For those of us in television, you know that you can produce anything, edit anything to make a person look great or not. And the way, when I saw it, I saw the first broadcast. And it was enraging because it was a hatchet piece to a man who had served in our military in an extremely important capacity by uh, people who in families knew the Corso and Trudeau, Trudeau knew each other very well. And why? Somebody in our government, I think, did not want the back engineering to come out, let alone the possibility of time travelers. So they have fixes in all the media so that, and I don't know if it goes on in Canada, but I know it does in the United States. There are controllers. Mm -hmm. They won't be called that. They'll be called uh, executive producer yeah. of. <laughs> I, I just want to jump in very quickly. Go. There, so first of all, um, <clears throat> I think you're exactly right about 2007-ish being the jumping off point for the uh, whistleblower explosion. Um, and there's a very clear reason for that, in my opinion, which is that we've, around that time, is when we developed a global infrastructure to accommodate whistleblowers. There was no WikiLeaks 10 years ago because we didn't have a global infrastructure to accommodate an organization grabbing digital data and throwing it out there. But now we have that infrastructure, and behold, here's WikiLeaks. It's like if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. Same for whistleblowers. We didn't have a YouTube prior to 2005. There was no YouTube. There was some video, but it wasn't, wasn't the same. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You start getting an infrastructure in place where people have a forum where they can talk. So all of this is a symptom that our whole civilization is going through this dramatic transformation right now. It's all based on uh, revolutions in technology, which means revolutions in communication, which means that people now can, can have a way to, to, uh, to tell their story. And by the way, regarding Corso, uh, I, I agree with you on Corso uh, completely. And uh, it's nice to remember that when he first wrote his book, he got his uh, forward by U.S. Senator Strom Thurmond, right. who I think was about 180 at the time <laughs> he wrote it. Um, actually, when, when Thurmond, he wrote this ringing endorsement of, of Corso's book because he knew him. Corso had had a tremendous amount 
of prestige and respect in his position. He was a, a Senate liaison, he was an assistant to Thurmond for uh, military matters. Thurmond loved him. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't know what the book was explicitly about, but he respected Corso and said, you know, this, is, this man is an American hero. When uh, the book came out and the media frenzy took place on Corso, the, the press all descended on Strom Thurmond, and he had to say basically, I don't know nothing about no UFOs, right. and then they pulled his forward. But wow. this was Corso. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing about Corso is, you know, he really, he kind of wrote his book and he kind of didn't write his book. So it was all on deadline. Uh, William Burns, Bill Burns of UFO Mag really wrote that together. Factual errors galore made it very easy to pick that book apart by skeptics who said, this is wrong, that's wrong, this is wrong. Although the fundamentals of what Corso said, uh, I've always felt were very logical. And everyone who knew Corso, a lot of people interviewed him, and they, everyone, I'm not aware of any one person who said he's full of it. No. Is it, is it worth getting the book? Oh, from any, yes, because the day I mean, after Roswell. Roswell. Yeah. The day after Roswell, yeah. so it's worth it. So it's interesting that they, they can't put a stop to that. They can put a stop to the, you know, the media, and, all, and he's no longer here. But well, they tried the making book. him look like a fool, as Linda That's said. Right. That's exactly right. And there's always been, and there are controllers in, in the media, in Canadian too, it's the same. Of course U.S. media is. Is, is, has been so tightly controlled for so long. There's uh, a, there's a joke. Yeah. Um, where we have a major station called CBC, Canadian Broadcast. Uh, yeah. Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. The public broadcaster. Uh, well, and we say controlled by Canada. That's what we <laughs> oh, <laughs> pretty yeah. much say. That's uh, I've done animal rights for many years, and they would always say, "Oh, nobody showed up at these protests," and I would be there, and there were thousands of people. So we, it was a, just a joke amongst our. Well, our the so bottom CBB line. controlled by the Bilderbergers. <laughs> yes. <laughs> probably be more apropos, but anyway. The bottom line is that Corso was saying that he was the one who took extraterrestrial technology from an office in the Pentagon, from a General Trudeau, who was a close friend of the President of the United States, don't forget that, mm -hmm. and was hand delivering into corporations to back engineer. And one of the most powerful of the leaks that was in 2007, comes from a man who said that he worked in a Palo Alto laboratory, also trying to back engineer, leaked a document that is commercial application research for extraterrestrial technology, CARAT is the acronym. Hmm. And the whole idea, he said, was that the Department of Defense in the United States was frustrated by the slowness of their government contractors. They're trying to back engineer extraterrestrial technology without anybody in the world knowing that they have it, and they want to get it patented and copyrighted in all of the various legal issues in the United States to keep it out of the hands of other nations. Mm -hmm. That's their mm -hmm. goal. Mm -hmm. And because the process was so slow, this whistleblower was a scientist said about 200 scientists of varying types were brought together and told that they, this was a program, the Department of Defense would be in charge, but they wanted them to be in Palo Alto in the 1980s in a mix where what we now call today the computer world that became Apple and everything. They wanted to see if a bunch of scientists with extraterrestrial technology could literally back engineer and accelerate this process. And he said, the thing about it, I, I got to communicate with him privately, this man. He said, when you come to work and they have been telling you that they want you to feel like you're completely the scientist that you are, but they have submachine guns in the room. Mm -hmm. Right there is the metaphor of the last 60 years, of our government certainly trying to go like this on anything related to extraterrestrial, needing scientists, the best scientists that there are. And how do you put those two together when they are antithetical? And there are so many stories of people being given offers of tremendous amounts of money to go underground and that what has been taking place underground 
probably in Canada as well as the United States, Europe, Australia, New Zealand, that if we could lift up the surface of this planet, what would be revealed would probably Absolutely. shock all of us. Absolutely. Now, I, I have a question. I'm going to, okay, so there's a whole other theory about UFOs, right? So what you guys are saying is that they're extraterrestrials, they come from off planet. There's a whole other theory that flying saucers were developed in Germany during the Second World War and, uh, and that the stories of them being from extraterrestrial origins really only came out after, this, after the Second World War and, and, but without any actual proof that these craft come from off planet. I can give I, you one right, opening I go context. Back to you, that's yeah. I want to say it, on that. Because where you need to frame this is actually before World War II. There was a book. Uh, I've seen it, I've read it. And uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was called The New Science or The New World Coming. But it was in the teens, it was written around 1917, and it was about a ongoing effort by certain groups in Germany who were talking about how that there were forces among them in which there was going to be a change in the world and that tall, blonde, blue-eyed, white-skinned super beings would become the dominant population of the planet. This is what the book is about. And that when Hitler began rising to power, uh, I have talked with the man who read the document I'm going to describe to you. He worked in army uh, crypto analysis in a southeastern uh, army base, but his check came from the CIA in Langley. Mm -hmm. And he was in Langley, and there's a basement archive. It's separate from Suitland, Maryland, which lots of intel stuff. This is a, a Langley archive that is underground. It's quite large. And they were going down there because his boss was looking for something very specific about disks because they were both assigned to work in a Project Blue Book, nothing like the phony Blue Book that was paraded for the media and mm -hmm. pubs. It was silly. No, this was the real Project Blue Book, and it was being handled through Fort Belvoir in Virginia. And it was going to the CIA. The CIA had units that were working, going all around the world where there were reports of disks and beings. This is where this guy worked. And he said they were looking for specific information on a specific shape, the shape of craft are indicators to the government of certain types. They're down there, they get a folder, and inside is a document that was written in 1927. And it was from an intel group in England to, and Rich and I, you've, you've uh, tried to tell me it was, I don't even know if it was the OSS in 1927. No. It's whatever the precursor was that we were using of any kind and it was the date is I know is inflexible. I know well, it was, was nineteen twenty. Signal intelligence that might have been it. There was well, communication between it was England, Army intelligence England in and the United States, and England is asking the United States in the document. So it's an England document to the US mm -hmm. in the CIA. Mm -hmm. Do you know anything about the silver discs that are rising in the skies above Piena Monday? And that was what year? Nineteen twenty seven. The war way later. Mm. And as I understand it from this man who worked for the CIA, Army cover, extraterrestrials, for reasons that I'm not sure, were literally physically working in Germany underground. And those were extraterrestrial craft. And some deal was supposed to be struck that then we hear about when the Nazis and Hitler pick it up later, and there are the Vril mm -hmm. yeah. and the, uh, the one that's so hard. The Hanabu. The Hanabu. Yeah. Were those made by German humans, 
or were those made by extraterrestrials and passed off to the world as germs? Well, they, they, they did have well, mediums that were supposedly in contact with people from Aldebaran or something like the, that. The uh, idea about uh, UFOs not being extraterrestrial and being the result of German technology, Nazi technology, I, I'm with Linda on this. Um, all you really need to do is go back through some of the historical sightings that we have that are very good sightings. And it, there's just no way to explain these as German slash Nazi tech. Is this before uh, the Second World War then? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. yes. Absolutely, well before. I mean, uh, if there are discs out of Panamunda in 1927, that's right. not German manufactured, not even a chance. <laughs> German, German <laughs> military was totally demilitarized mm -hmm. in 1927. They were trying ever so hard to sneakily do some uh, training with uh, Russia, Soviet Union actually, and even that was just... That didn't really get going until after Hitler got into power. There, are, I was, um, I did archive uh, work in the Canadian archives uh, a number of years ago, looking at reports that Canadian citizens would send into the RCMP, um, Royal Canadian Mounted Police. Right. So back in the 60s and 70s and 80s, if you Canadian citizen had a UFO sighting, you would send it into the police. They would send it off to um, Ottawa where scientists in white coats and bald heads would promptly run away from them and just file them and never look at them again. But the reports are there, you can read them. So I encountered one report from uh, an elderly man writing in 1981 about when he was 25 years old in 1936. So this is a time when the Nazis were in power, but hear this. He was employed as a young man doing aerial mapping operations for the Canadian government in the way, way, way north. Because now there's aircraft, and the government wanted accurate topography, geography, maps of that distant region, which they could now do mm -hmm. with aerial photography. So he was at, uh, in the Northwest Territories, way up in uh, what's called the Barren Lands. There's no trees that grow up there. There's nothing there, even to this day, at a place called Islemer Lake. I had to look this up on Google Maps. It's, there's middle of nowhere. And he writes, this is a meticulous man. He was doing a before-flight check on his craft, one of those cool aircraft that can land on the water. And he said, and I happened for whatever reason to glance skyward. Now this is a, uh, either spring or summer 1936. And there was the vehicle in question, he said, completely stationary. How long it had been there, for whatever reason, he did not know. It was, uh, he didn't know how large it was because there was no clouds whatsoever, but it was, ex it was right there and he thought it was large. Mm -hmm. Slightly oblong in shape, no markings on it whatsoever, no sound. In an instant it turned from a north-south configuration to east-west and then he said it accelerated instantly. Instant acceleration, he said, from the moment of takeoff until it was at the horizon was a matter of moments. And uh, he attached his military service record uh, to prove his identity, his veracity. That was not available to me, it was not in the archives, but very, very interesting, compelling story. If and that's not good enough, and There's just one yeah, really yeah. important point. We humans, biologically and technologically, we cannot go from static inertia to the horizon. Well, unless you have a completely Did radical system of propulsion, and good seat belts. Good seat belts. Good seat but, but we're in 1936. <laughs> Not I, a I think sometimes Not a people right. lose the concept yes, that yes, something that's a good that point. goes. That is not no, it's anything but any that physical, we can deal with. Any right. physical exactly, yeah. creature made out of atoms would have the same issue, right? Well, okay. Unless now. you have an artificial gravitational yes. field that you've constructed around mm -hmm, you, mm -hmm. and then it's not an issue. In terms That's of different. what we're learning today is that the ET technology is literally interacting with the fundamental laws of vacuum and physics, and they're it's a complicated concept, but if you can change just one or two pieces of formula, you can match every single thing that is reported about UFOs, including them being larger on the inside than they look on the outside, mm -hmm. being able to go from a to yeah. infinity, mm -hmm. and it all turns on a tiny change, the tiniest change in a physical reality that is our physics, and we can't do this. We cannot do this tampering. But if we could, everything that we see falls out of this. And 
the craft on the inside is like a completely different dimension than the earth dimension that it's in. It's very complex physics, but we're talking about physics that's becoming understandable. Okay, so yeah. the, a the aliens, whoever they are, there's different, people talk about different, you know, there's good, good aliens, bad aliens, grays, whatever. Some say they're bad, some say they're, uh, they're uh, disarming our, our nuclear missiles. Well, they're interested in our nuclear technology, for sure. I don't think they and want us to have a nuclear war. No, that kills the life they need. Fr from 1945 to the end of the century, there were over 2,000 nuclear explosions on planet Earth, over 2,000. Um, there's a couple of, there's a chilling YouTube video, you can look for this, just uh, has in, in kind of real time, condensed down to 10 minutes, every nuclear explosion on planet Earth with a map of where it took. It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, when we talk about the environmental damage that we're dealing with, whether it's uh, climate change or what have you, I don't hear anyone talking about how we blown our stratosphere into smithereens mm -hmm. with over 2,000 nuclear detonations. Um, what we do know, in fact, this is in my yeah. new book, uh, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. I interviewed a um, retired US Navy man who uh, in the early 1960s took place in something called Operation Dominic. So from April to October of 1962, right after the end of the Cuban Missile Crisis, the U.S. government, in its infinite wisdom, decided it was a good idea to have 36 nuclear explosions in the upper stratosphere off the coast of Hawaii. Great idea. <laughs> so um, huge amount of damage, obviously, yeah. to the environment. Um, I spoke to two gentlemen who were involved in the Navy at that time. Both of them said explicitly, A, there were bogeys every single time mm. that they looked that, that when there was going to be a detonation. Wow. One of them was explicitly involved in Dominic, and he said this happened all the time, and every time just before detonation took place, the bogeys would disappear. And we knew this always, except on one occasion, actually, when one seemed to come down. And it was a failed uh, retrieval operation in late October 62. It's a fascinating story, and I've written about it. But the point is, they're interested in our nuclear technology. They've always been interested in our nukes. You go right back to the beginning, 1940s. All of, of the Freedom of Information Act documents that the US has, which is only the tiniest, the tiniest sliver of the actual reality of the situation. Mm -hmm. It's almost as if you have like this, this uh, white wall and you throw black paint over it and there's a couple of white spots and that's what we have to look that's at. Right. So those are our documents. Mm -hmm. In those documents, it's evident that are America's nuclear installations from the 40s onward, Los Alamos, Oak Ridge, Hanford in the state of Washington and others, and then the missile sites. All of them were visited continuously by objects that didn't look normal, that is disc shape or round, didn't act normal, like they could loiter indefinitely and then just hover uh, and then take off, um, shoot straight up, and that, <laughs> you know, this got very uh, serious attention, obviously, from the um, American and authorities. And the head of White Sands Missile Range at the time of Project Paperclip referred to all those disks that were showing up when they would try their rocket tests as, yeah. this is a quote, peculiar phenomenon. And yeah, it made exactly. local newspapers. This is the head of White Sands operation that is taking German missiles and they're having all of these white disks, and that's what he called them, peculiar. So your, your question, though, was are they good, are they bad, are they indifferent? They're interested in our nukes. They're, I'm sure they must be concerned about the fact that human beings have control over these nukes because this is very dangerous, this, and it's probably not good for them. Is, mm -hmm. is there any? Probably. There's got to be some level of government working with some of these these extraterrestrials. Do you guys, I'm sure in some of your research, you must know not just about the craft and the mutilation, but how about the individuals conducting these experiments and running these craft? And uh, there must be some sort of communication with them when we're learning this back engineering. And My workshop yeah. tomorrow at the Modern uh, Knowledge Tour, that's exactly what I'm going to be dealing about for two hours. So actually talking about the actual types of extraterrestrial and gov government relationship. I think there definitely was an agreement. I think the United States in or close to the end of World War II made an agreement. Is it fair to say, guys, is it fair to say, and either one ask the question, are there extraterrestrials walking amongst us? If we walk down the street, is it that a far-fetched thing? I think we would both say yes. Yes, and I would say hybrids. Yes. Yeah. The hybrid so is probably 
the most under-discussed subject and probably the most important to every decision the United States has been making since World War II. And so they look human. When you say hybrid, that we would not know I could go to a store, to a 7-Eleven, buy something, and the cashier could be one. Depends on which genetic generation. Some of them, yes, though. You would not, I don't think you'd be able to tell. Do some, do they even know they're hybrids? That's yes. Me. So okay. I, yeah. yes. What are they doing we working at 7-Eleven? But we really do agree. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so this that's is funny. What we need. That's funny. It's We've collected our own, done our own research, and uh, so, yeah. It is really, really a fundamental issue, and you can step back from this and say, okay, if, if there are extraterrestrial biological entities, and they have, as the, some people have told me, one man who re had retired from the Defense Intelligence Agency told me that they knew in his division that three competing geopolitical territorial conflicts among extraterrestrials had been affecting this planet for at least 270 million years, then we, according to a lot of documents, we were made by one or more. That means that technically Neanderthal and Cro-Magnon homo sapiens sapien and however far back you want to go, we are somebody's genetic construct. Why would anything from outer space be doing this? And this gets into an extremely complicated area that I think Corso was trying to address in that NBC studio. Well, that isn't we it that where the battle where the battlefield were a prize. Well, but we're a where, prize. I, I'm, where I'm headed and you can pick it up is that everything interacting with this planet may not be strictly extraterrestrial from the solar system next door. That a lot of the phenomena may truly be from a far distant future. And the whole, this is the hardest part of all of this phenomena to grasp. Past, present, and future are simultaneous. Mm -hmm. And that us, 50,000 years in the future could be at extinction. So we're doing this to ourselves, Linda? Is that what you're kind this of sort of? This is what RAF Bentwaters is all about. But, but hang in here for just okay. one more idea, and I'll throw it to Rich. If we at this table, knowing our current human form, right here as mm -hmm. we're talking to each other, who, no matter who made us. And we could see through a time dilation machine that all of the seven billion and whatever happens next, that there is a bloodline, there is an arc, and that it can go for 50,000 years and in the process the technology becomes so advanced it can bend space-time. As soon as, in quantum physics, it's Einstein, when you bend space and you put a point of, of space together with another point, which that now you're affecting gravity, always time is also manipulated. And that what has been uh, emerging out of cases like R.E.F. Bentwaters and others, is that what gets to the skies and to the surface of Earth may actually be time travelers who would be like doctors, mm -hmm. would be like paramedics. They have a serious problem where physics is advanced, but the bodies have deteriorated to such a point because why? Because they cloned. They cloned and used hybrids and sex seized. And it's the same problem that we are looking at now in the issue of biodiversity on the earth and genetically modified crops. I was going to say, it sounds like human Monsanto. Every scientist will it tell you. It would take you, a lot less than 50,000 years, well, though, Linda, for but, that whole mess to but, happen. But it's, we are taking all of our biodiversity down to a few strains. Mm -hmm. If you do that same thing over 50,000 years in humanoid containers, and you leave sexual genes to cloning and to hybridization, mm -hmm. the 
the story so far is that they are dying. They've reached extinction. DNA will no longer replicate. So what do they do? They're advanced enough to come back in time because they can fold space. And you come back to the last century where genetic material on Earth was healthy enough to harvest. And it's Penniston and Bentwaters who used the word that came into his mind, allegedly from a download from this craft in the forest. They are using us as Band-Aids, meaning genetically they are harvesting, relating to something 50,000 years in the future to survive. And that's why when you ask that question, is it good or bad, I wrestle with this all the time. But in my first book, An Alien Harvest, it came out in 1989, I remember feeling that even though I was in the repulsive subject of animal mutilations, that there was something that I intuitively felt that it was a survival issue. And the survival can be a two-way or three-way street. And so where we sit today in 2014, where humans are about, it feels like every day, getting closer and closer mm -hmm. to war of mm -hmm. humans, mm -hmm. that something related to us, something intimately related to the evolution of this planet is involved with trying to survive and the irony in all of this is it may be it's our survival as well, that they're braided that's what is repeated over and over and over again in the human abduction syndrome, that whatever is happening, no matter who made us, we are intimately involved in a timeline with something coming from the future that needs genetic material from this planet for it to survive, and if it survives, we survive. That's how complex all of this is. Well, speaking of timelines, it looks like we're just about out of time here. Um, so if people want to... Um, Let's jump on another timeline and well, extend it. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we're just going to wrap it up here uh, be, uh, so we can get on with uh, Michael Tellinger. But uh, Linda, that's a great, that's a, really something to think about. If, and people can come and see your, uh, you're doing a presentation tomorrow. Lecture, right? we're, I think each one of us lecture. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to, yeah. of course. I mean, but we, we are, well. lecture and workshop. Is this together? You guys are doing it? Uh, no, we're doing each doing our own. Okay. Yeah. So, and uh, you've got books and you've got a website, Linda? Yes. <laughs> My books are too big to lug around and ship around. And I made them big so that the documents and the photographs could be really, really clear. But don't be overwhelmed by that. No. Th <laughs> I think y you would find them very valuable. But, so I only have one place okay. and the prices never change. It isn't like eBay or s others. Um, and it's earthfiles.com. My news website, earthfiles.com, uh, has been there since 1999 and evolving and huge now. And so there is a uh, shop there where all my work always is. Mm -hmm. And uh, earthfiles at earthfiles.com is my email. Okay. And I'd look forward to hearing from anybody about anything. Okay, that's awesome. And Richard, you're, what's, you want to just tell us briefly about your, uh, your subject matter tomorrow? I'd be happy to, yes. Um, I've been honing and working this uh, lecture since I've been on this tour. It's a 90-minute uh, extravaganza into a rethinking of the entire UFO subject, which is really the, the theme of my latest book, UFOs for the 21st Century Mind. That is dealing with the UFO phenomenon in terms of its its intrinsic mystery, why it, I believe it stands really at the very edge of our, our, our un ability to understand our, our worldview as it is, and then beyond that. Uh, the politics, the deep politics, not the uh, grade school level version of politics that we get in our media, but what's actually going on in terms of uh, the concealment of information, why that is so, why the science of um, that in, in affects the UFO phenomenon is so very important. I've got a lot to say on that and then looking into the future as to how I, I really think all of this is going to come to an end in another decade or so. When you say <laughs> it's going to come to an end, what does this, that mean? This, see, <laughs> this, this is, we're, in a, we're not in a holding pattern. So we're in a situation where our, our, our society is, is almost leapfrogging over itself. Uh, 
and reinventing itself every decade. And I believe something's going to transform this situation so that something will come out. I, I, I don't Positive know. Positive or? What will that no, do for it, real estate values? A, it'll be a big, listen, we're, w this, this whole everything that we have here is, uh, is ephemeral. And uh, something major is going to change it. So it and sounds to me that we're, we're speaking of like a shift in consciousness. Are we talking something We're going to have like a shift that? in infrastructure. We're going to have a lot of crazy people pulling their hair out of their heads, running around in circles. Shift mm -hmm. in consciousness. People have been talking about That was supposed to happen in December 21, 2012, if you recall. <laughs> uh, not saying <laughs> that it won't happen. That was another timeline, Richard. Sorry. Ah, <laughs> yes. There we go. No, I don't. I think um, what we're going to have to do is, is called growing up. So we're going to wow. have to deal with a new situation. And... Um, it's like all aspects of growing up, it will be painful, but it will be necessary, and I think we'll come out of it better than before. My workshop, uh, I've done the last, the last few of these, it's worked out very well. I actually sit down and have discussion with people, and we tend to share experiences and try to figure out what is going on. A number of people have been experiencers who've talked mm -hmm. about um, their, um, their situation, and um, I'm basically leading an intimate discussion among people who are interested in this. Okay, great. And what's your website for people Richard, who want to follow up? Uh, RichardDolanPress.com. Okay. Guys, thank you so much for all the work you do, for being uh, pioneers in what you do, and for moving us forward, because I think your work is so important in just... Uh, and you add so much credibility so that when I go home and I talk about UFOs and ETs, my family doesn't look at me and say, okay, you know what, well, here we go again. Thank you. I feel, I feel like the luckiest person I know. I get to research something that I'm truly obsessively fascinated by, and I get to do it uh, all the time. It can be maddening. I'm sure you agree, Linda. But it's also incredibly rewarding because yeah. uh, we are, we're both explorers. We're both uh, doing what we can do to, to figure out, I think, what is one of the a series of the greatest mysteries that we can be encountering. And it's in mm -hmm. the process of going through this, by the way, in which you reinvent your world view countless times, because that's what happens, that um, that's, that's true growth right there. Absolutely, and whether yeah. we'll get to the, the goal line and figure it all out, I don't know, but it's the journey that matters. And it feels like it is trying to find out what we really are. Yes. All right. Yeah. So exactly. Hugh, from now on, when I say, what planet are you from? I, I can actually <laughs> mean that. <laughs> And, and my answer will remain the same. <laughs> Which, I want, I know Which one? one? Arcturus. <laughs> okay, okay. okay. The so red, blue, and white one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, guys, the for coming one. on the show. To, and for people watching tonight, of course, show up at the Science Center tomorrow at uh, 9 a.m. And you can uh, meet these guys and participate. And uh, we're going to take a little for break a right now. Very normal discussion. Exactly. And we're going to come back in a couple of minutes with Michael Tellinger. And we're looking forward to that. We'll be right back. Thank you, guys.